Welcome to Booked, where two guys tell you about the books they're reading. I'm Livia Snedden. And I'm Rob Olson. The book we're reviewing this week is We Sold Our Souls by Grady Hendrix. And here's a little bit about the author. Grady Hendrix is an American author, journalist, public speaker, and screenwriter known for his best-selling 2014 novel Horror Store. Hendrix lives in Manhattan and was one of the founders of the New York Asian Film Festival. Hmm. So that's that bio came from Wikipedia <laughs> because the like three other bios I looked at were all like ridiculously long. Uh oh. And um, you know, because I, I did like the Google search where I put in Amazon and then I put in this and that came up and I clicked on that and I was like, Nope. Yeah. And I clicked back and I went, to, I think it was Goodreads, and I was like, Nope. And then the third I was like, Wikipedia. All right, let's look at this. And I was like, Oh, look at that. It's one paragraph, like three sentences, yeah. and that's what really someone's bio should be. I agree. Yeah. I mean, uh, f- fucking paragraphs. People just need to get over. Like, I, I just like, what if, like, if we did bios for ourselves, like if we had to create a bio for ourselves, it would be like, mm-hmm. Rob Olson is a, you know, a podcaster yep. who reviews books and lives in Illinois. Mm-hmm. There it is. I, um, you know, you said that, and I was like, "No, no, mine would be like four paragraphs long, but but, <laughs> but, but a worthy four paragraphs. Not like these authors who write these really lengthy bios. Like, you know, that's yeah, mine would be a legit. Worthy. Yeah, no, that's exactly what mine would say. Exactly the same thing. Louis Snedden is a podcaster. He lives in Illinois. There so, it is. There you go. Yeah. That's more than anybody needs to know about me. All right. So for the brevity we gave you in the bio. Strap yourselves in, kids. It's uh, time for the synopsis. In the 1990s, heavy metal band Dirt Work was poised for breakout success, but then lead singer Terry Hunt embarked on a solo career and rocketed to stardom as Coffin, with a K, leaving his fellow bandmates to rot in obscurity. Two decades later, former guitarist Chris Pulaski works as the night manager of a Best Western. She's tired, broke, and unhappy. Everything changes when a shocking act of violence turns her life upside down and she begins to suspect that Terry sabotage more than just the band. Chris hits the road, hoping to reunite with the rest of her bandmates and confront the man who ruined her life. It's a journey that will take her from the Pennsylvania Rust Belt to a celebrity rehab center to a music festival from hell. A furious power ballad about never giving up, even in the face of overwhelming odds, we sold our souls as an epic journey into the heart of a conspiracy-crazed, pill-popping, paranoid country that seems to have lost its very soul, where only a lone girl with a guitar can save us all. Oh. Oh, this synopsis. First of all, I have I have a bone to pick with the synopsis, because from what I remember now, it's been a little while since I read this book. Coffin is the name of the band he's in. He is actually the Blind King. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so. I think it's kind of like a Nine Inch Nails thing where Trent Reznor was the band, and he just had people kind of like play with him every now and then. I took it as that, but still, it could be. That's you possible. didn't call Trent Reznor Nine Inch Nails. You called him Trent Reznor. So, hey, uh, you set up these notes for us to look at. Did you copy and paste this from Amazon? The synopsis. Yes. Are you going to talk about the weird spacing between yeah. the words? Yes, yeah. I am. Yeah. Yep. So uh, that's one thing that uh, <laughs> just bothers the shit out of me is like extra spacing. And there's like three different. You could tell like either someone was copying and pasting different sentences together and they just didn't care about the spacing between words and after punctuation or or they just are terrible at their own spacing. And it's everywhere. And that really bothered me as I, I was I had my mic muted while you were reading it and I was like, what the fuck is going on with these spaces? <laughs> um, I, you know, how come that's not part of, um, spell check? I mean, well, I'll tell you what I do whenever I, I make a document that's got words before I send it to the people who are going to be reading it. I do a find and replace. And I, in the find, I do two spaces and then in the replace, I do one space done. Yeah. That's clever. I, I just, I guess I don't know why, why software doesn't, um, at least alert you to that. Yeah, it really should. I mean, it's, yeah, it should. You're right. So anyway, yeah. now that we've criticized the bio, the person who <laughs> put the synopsis together, not the, well, a little, so I criticized the synopsis itself. You criticize the spacing in the synopsis. The synopsis. Yeah. The, 
let's criticize this book for half an hour and then move on with our <laughs> with our lives. Well, before before we jump into criticizing the book, I want to criticize myself a little bit. Um, anybody who is a regular listener may notice that this is like a week late. We took a week off, and it was because I was pretty under the weather in a way where mostly when I wasn't working, I was sleeping, and I just couldn't get this book uh, under uh, uh, taken care of. So apologies if you've been waiting patiently to hear our review of this book. It's my fault. I wasn't feeling very well. Are you feeling better now? Yeah, I think I'm uh, going to bounce back. You sound good. Good. <laughs> All right. So as the synopsis indicates, uh, we're introduced to Chris, who is our protagonist for this whole book. Um, she, in her early teens, decided she wanted to play guitar and be a rock star, and she cobbled together a band um, that had some some moderate success. They were heading in the right direction, playing lots of gigs for a number of years, uh, mostly small places, open for some bigger bands. Um, and then, um, on the on the edge of their biggest break ever, um, where they were going to move into stardom and get a record deal and do all that stuff, it all kind of fell apart. And uh, Terry, who was the singer of the band, um, wound up uh, with a manager named Rob Anthony, um, trying to get them to, to sign some paperwork that was really going to give Terry the rights to everything. And uh, ultimately, it all fell apart. Uh, the, the other bandmates... Went on with their own lives, um, a couple of them, some moderate success just, you know, in, in everyday non-rock and roll lives. But uh, our protagonist, Chris, um, she winds up like the night manager at a, at a I was going to say a shitty motel, but it's a Best Western. So I don't know if I want to, you know, an, an okay hotel. I don't know. Probably one of the, like... I don't know. I, I I recently went on a road trip to Austin, and on the way down uh, with Ryan Ryan, the marketing intern, and on the way down, we uh, we stopped at because it was just like a one night kind of didn't want to do the whole drive in one trip, so we were just like driving until we went to sleep at this you know hotel or whatever. He found this like forty dollar a night hotel by the airport in Memphis, and the whole idea was oh it's cheap, so whatever. And it kind of sucked, and um, I didn't like it that much. And then on the way back for like, you know, f like maybe eighty dollars, there was like probably something like a Best Western, and so uh, the experience was was night and day different. And I'm thinking like I'll just pay pay a little extra, you know, to have some some guarantees of comfort and stuff like that. So you went from a West Western. God damn it! I can't do it. How could I not say these two words together? For anybody listening, <laughs> this is take number three. I'm me trying to say this. So you went from a worst Western to the best Western. Is that is that how that went down? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it was from the worst to the best. That's exactly yeah, what happened. Did we say it a best <sighs> Western in, in Corydon? Was that a best Western? I think you're I think it is. I think it yeah, was. The haunted hotel. Yeah. Uh yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so um to get on with our story. Um, Chris hears that Coffin is doing a final farewell tour um, or a final farewell uh, show, series of shows in Las Vegas, not necessarily a tour. And she decides that she, as it says in the synopsis, wants to get the rest of the band together and go confront Terry, who is wildly popular. I don't know, like, to who I would equate him in um, rock stardom too i don't know if there's like a metal band that's big enough to to really encompass what the band coffin is in this story it's like the beatles but for metal yeah i was thinking like i was feeling it more like um like a marilyn manson yeah well maybe, maybe like a like a like a marilyn manson from 20 years ago because now marilyn manson's just yeah i don't know have you seen marilyn manson lately mm. No, no. Life has, not I, been like, kind. Life has not been kind to Marilyn Manson. Google Marilyn Manson while you say whatever you're going to say next. So we take the journey with her as she goes and uh, tries to catch up with uh, with the three other bandmates. And uh, I think there's, you know, it, it all goes really horribly wrong. Oh, he's not looking that good. <laughs> Told you. He just looks kind of like chubby. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. He used to like be the kind of guy who, 
he had two looks. He had that you just want to kind of giggle at him look, and then they kind of like, oh, he's really kind of fucking scary looking. Yeah. Um. And and now, now like like all of us, age has uh has done its thing, and yeah, Marilyn Manson no longer really intimidating. Not yeah, not so, not so much. Um, <clears throat> this is one of those books where. After, like, the establishment of, like, the, the basic kind of, you know, drive of the story, we're probably not going to be able to say much about it. Um, <clears throat> but I think that uh, we, could, we could at least talk about some of the things that uh, happen to make make things go horribly wrong. Just because it happened so early in the book, I don't really consider it a spoiler. But, like, so Chris goes to visit. Um, the, the first person she goes to visit is the is the person from the band who lives closest to where she currently lives, and that's Scotty Rocket, who was uh, he was like the rhythm guitar, right? Or I whatever. So, yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. He's the other guitarist, and um, he's got like you know it seems like a pretty you know normal suburban family. He got a wife and a couple of kids and everything. But when he when she goes to visit him, he's like locked himself in the basement, and um, and the wife seems a little concerned about him and she's like, Hey, let me know if you think this is something serious when Chris goes to visit Scotty in the basement. And there's this kind of like, there's this moment where (laughs) when she first first gets in the basement, they're looking at, she's looking at all like the boxes and piles of like uh, uh, merchandise that they used to sell on the road for the band dirt work. And um, talking about how that used to be what, Used to be valuable. Used to be what got them from gig to gig, kind of. And now it's just piles of worthless junk. And for a moment, I was thinking, like, man, I'm glad I don't have like piles of booked, booked merch, just like, <laughs> like <laughs> boxed up all over the place. Because that would get that. That sounded so sad when that scene mm-hmm. happened, where she was like looking at like basically what is the the final physical manifestation of like 20 years of of being, you know, metal metal band stars or whatever it was was like pretty it was pretty depressing yeah and he's um scotty is full-on like tin foil hat yeah crazy um and and he keeps insisting that um he's being watched he's being followed that you know terry is in his head and this is one of the things that wasn't mentioned in the synopsis at at all really is that there's likely a supernatural element to this. So I'm saying likely cuz there's a fucking supernatural element to it. But at this point <laughs> in the book you're not you're just not sure if it's Scotty's just nuts. Um because he comes off as pretty crazy. And um you know the 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 indications of a crazy person saying there's supernatural stuff going on isn't necessarily believable. But he does indicate and this is very important. He does indicate to Chris that the solution to all of this could very well be in the last album that they wrote that was never published. Yeah. And that's, I mean, like, and that's where it gets all cool. Like to to be very blunt about the book, the first like 50 or so pages are a lot of her just being this rundown, piss off old rocker and um, just kind of hopeless and sad and bleak and everything. And then the visit with Scotty really kicks off like, Oh shit. Like, something weird is going on here and that's what kind of ju- jump starts the story so the first like i don't know 50 or so pages it was a little difficult for me to to get to find the buy in but like once um the visit with Scotty happened i was like well i'm not putting this book down until it's done another character worth mentioning um in a it's probably be a little more in spoiler talk but in an interesting way this character that's woven through the story named Melanie um, all we know about Melanie really, and in her tie into the story is she's a huge coffin fan and she really doesn't want to miss the final opportunity, um, to ever see them. So she's got a little online weird friend that she flirts with. So she's got a boyfriend. The boyfriend's pretty useless. He just plays video games. That's like all he does. Um, but this guy says, Hey, I've actually got a ticket. I've got two tickets. If you want to make it down, if you can make it down here to Vegas, like we're going to do this. So she decides that they're going to change up their lives and her and her boyfriend are going to move to Vegas. So she starts working and saving and working and saving to be able to, to get to this show. And we visit her a few times through the course of this story, but really in a way that's unrelated to the main 
to the main story. Like there's no tie in to her. She's not, you know, she's a fan of coffin. She's not, you know, doesn't know the, the, um, the protagonist other than I would imagine just the fact that, you know, that they're in the news, you know, this guy, um, Terry hunt was, was in the band dirt work, you know, right. some people know who big fans know who dirt work were and, you know, who the other band members were, but it was an interesting addition to the story that was done in a, you know, I don't know about a unique way, but an interesting way. Yeah. The Melanie story really doesn't, it builds a little bit, very, very small amount throughout the book. And then the big payoff is obviously what we're going to be talking about spoilers, but it was an interesting thing. And, and I have some thoughts about her that I will definitely talk, talk with you about in spoiler talk. Um, we do have a little, we do touch on in one way or another, I think everybody from dirt work, right? So there's, Tuck, who is the bass player from the band, who is, I guess, just like a giant black dude um, Mm -hmm. who seems to have things seems to have worked out pretty well for him. He's in like a a pretty fancy neighborhood and he's living, a you know, another comfortable life with a wife and kids and everything like that. Um, Bill, who was their drummer, who I won't go into the reasons why, but is is in a wheelchair, um, who after the everything happens with the band. Um, ends up running like a spa, like a rehab spa for rich people. Yep. Um, and then obviously Terry, who uh, who the blind blind king, who is is from Coffin, will end up seeing somewhere in the book as well. So you get to see, kind of catch up with what everybody in the band is doing at one point, and and see how they play into the overall plot. And um, really, honestly, the only character that comes up much more besides that that's. There's well, one might be spoilery, so I'm not gonna bring it up, but like uh we see Chris's brother at the beginning of the book, little Charles, who I think is just basically a cop. So like there's this great scene that happens at the beginning of the book where she's working overnight and basically just like low low key hating her life, and then this dude <laughs> dude who's like staying at the Best Western, um just kind of strolls in at like two in the morning or something to the lobby of the Best Western, completely naked except for a t- uh, a a pillowcase over his head that he'd cut eye holes in. And she, she says, Hey, Mr. Whoever it was, you can't do that. And he's like, that's not, I'm not him. And he just does not like denies that he, he denies it's obviously him. And she, he just denies it. And then he just pisses all over the desk of the best Western and goes back to his room and she has to call the cops. And that's how we discover her little brother is a cop. I was really worried. Cause that's, it's the first scene in the book. And I was like, if this whole fucking book is like this, <laughs> the pissing scene. Yeah. I was like, Oh, it was a little campy. Man. Oh, so yeah, that's it. We go on a cross country adventure, some supernatural elements getting in the way. Um, we're with Chris basically the whole time. Um, and, and her, her, her quest to be the lone girl with a guitar that can save us all. <laughs> Yeah, and I don't want to. Ru- I don't want to ruin much. Um, but like the word "soul" pops up a lot, so I guess we should at least acknowledge because the book is called "We Sold Our Souls," and in the synopsis it says, um, "Country that has seems to have lost its very soul." So like the soul is a big focus of of this book, and I will have to say that the soul is something that is important, like the idea of the soul and, and the value of a soul, but also kind of that um, more spiritual idea of the world or the country or or whatever, having a soul as well is definitely analyzed. Yeah. uh, There are interesting concepts in this book and I was going to save some of this for the wrap up, but I want to touch on this one was completely eye opening. So if you think about the concept of selling your soul, which is hard not to do where the book is called, we sold our souls. (laughs) Um, At one point it's, it's implied that, you know, it used to be very difficult for the devil to get your soul. Like you had, if you think about this, if you've ever seen this portrayed in um, older literature or whatever, it's like the devil sitting with somebody signing a contract in blood with a feather, right? Like that's, that's a pretty fair yeah. assessment of how one sells their soul. <laughs> At one point it's implied that perhaps now selling your soul just happens through EULAs and user license agreements, mm-hmm. which the average person clicks I don't know, two, three times a week, doesn't even look at them, right? Yeah. Like, I accept the terms and conditions. 
literally over the last few months, every website in the world has updated oh, yeah. their, yep. their terms and conditions, and we have all blindly accepted them, right? Blindly accepted them. Rob, you just got a new phone. How many things do you think you accepted uh, on your new phone just oh, over man. the course of the first day of setting it up? Uh, well, yeah, because I, I reinstall. I don't. This is probably a little nerdy, but I don't. I don't copy backups onto my phone from previous phones. I set up everything brand new when I get a new a new device. And so, like every app I installed, I had to you know accept whatever I had to accept because it wasn't already accepted. So yeah. Um, there's well, the nice thing, I guess, the comfort I take is that like since there's like 80 apps, everybody gets like one 80th of my soul, so they're not yeah. getting they're not yeah, getting a lot true. for that's that. That's true. Yeah, but it's funny because <laughs> in the in the times I've read this book, which is probably like two weeks, week and a half, whatever, two weeks. You know, I, I know I've clicked on a couple of these things, and God damn it, I've thought about this idea every <laughs> single time. Now I didn't go bother to look and see if I was actually selling my soul. You're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Scroll to the bottom. I agree. Fine, whatever. That's kind of. Yeah. But yeah, it was it was a, it was a very interesting concept. Uh, probably not the first time. I can't imagine it's the first time. It's the first time I've seen it though. To be honest, um, the whole idea of this kind of modern digital selling our soul was, I found that part of the book a little bit kind of preachy or complaining like it was um like the boomers talking about the millennials kind of that's how the feeling i got about it like these damn kids you know? sell their, but, but in my day you just have to <laughs> prick yourself and get some blood to sign and sell your soul now i had to lose a button and do it yeah <laughs> back in my day i had to lose a fiddle battle with the devil or whatever you know yeah there yeah. are no fiddles in this book which is zero quite honestly a little surprising in retrospect considering yeah it's so musical <laughs> So, all right. Uh, I think we're about ready to head over to spoiler talk. What do you think? Um, yeah, I feel like uh, I feel like spoiler talk is going to be pretty, pretty, pretty big this time. Pretty weighty. Um, so for those of you uninitiated, patreon.com slash booked one dollar a month um, gets you access to spoiler talk when we have them, which is pretty frequent now with books. Um, it also gets you our undying gratitude, which is arguably a little more important. So if you haven't yet, head over to patreon.com slash booked. Um, you know, you can do more than a dollar. That's totally cool. But really, do the buck. It's cost you 12 bucks a year, and you get spoiler talk and our gratitude. All right. We are back from spoiler talk. Um, and as I guessed, we really talked about a lot of stuff. So if you have read the book and you want to hear a, a deeper conversation on some of the bigger issues... Uh, if you have, if you don't plan on reading the book, you just want to hear us talk about like the the story in total. patreoncom slash booked dollar a month. You get more and more and more and more and more. You want to start the the wrap ups? Um, no, because okay. I want to address something we talked about in spoiler talk. So first of all, Rob has a very astute eye um, that I do not um, yet have, but as a as just a lad, I'm, I'm working on. So I want to give public credit um, to how how well you envision things sometimes. Yeah, well, thank you. The second thing is. Um, there are 30 plus chapters in this book. And the thing that we didn't mention that I think provides a great framework for the book is that the end of each chapter is a snippet of some type of media. So it could be some of them take place in the past. Some of them take place in the few. This book takes place slightly in the future. So um, some of them take place in the future. But it's always like a little uh, part of an article or the transcript of an interview with somebody close to the band. In some cases, it's like conspiracy theory radio happens yeah. a few times where it's like a <laughs> caller calling in to warn people about impending doom or whatever. But it provides a real nice framework for the rest of the story. So that's uh wanted to mention that too. I thought that was uh, and it again not you know necessarily unique, but I think that uh, Grady Hendrix did that in a in a really good way, and it was one of the things I really appreciated about this book. Yeah, I'll agree. It was a cool little insight into, uh, and it did a good job of like um, giving us past information in a way where you didn't have to have a whole chapter about it. So it was efficient, uh, but also like um, it fit well. Yeah, yeah, it did. Um, yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready for uh, for wrap ups. And then then we're going to play a little game. So stick around. Oh, this, little bit. this one might be fun. Who knows? So uh, go ahead, Rob. I'll let you uh, I'll let you do the honors. All right. I will be honest with you. Um, I got about uh, 50, 60 pages into this book, maybe a little bit more um, before I really kind of started feeling uh, like I was hitting a stride. And probably about 100 pages into this book, it's about 330 pages total, about 100 pages into the book, 
I stopped reading and went and I read the synopsis. <laughs> I didn't even tell the <laughs> because I was like, what the fuck is going on? And so I had to like, I had to kind of give myself a framework and the synopsis honestly wasn't super helpful, but at least I kind of understood um, what I was getting into because there's, there's kind of a, a serious shift in the, in toward the beginning of the book where as Livius kind of alluded to earlier, there's a little bit of supernatural stuff going on and, and, uh, and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, the book just like hits a moment and then it takes off and it does not let off the gas until, you know, um, there's about 10 pages left. Uh, it, it kind of slows down a little bit. Um, but in a great way, like it's, it's a very engaging story. And, and the, the Chris Pulaski character who is our protagonist is, is, is a great, uh, person to, to follow along. And you really kind of, I don't say identify, but you, you feel for the character, you're rooting for the character. And even when she doesn't seem to be making the best decisions in the world, um, she's that underdog that you want to see succeed. So you have that kind of consistency throughout the book. And even when we cut a few times over to the Melanie character, um, she's also got kind of that underdog. We want to see her um, reach whatever goal she's going for, kind of feel for her too. And um, yeah, I, I can't can't spoil all the, the stuff that's like the best stuff to talk about. But I will say that like the way that the supernatural stuff happens, how they incorporate souls as a concept into the book, I feel like it well, was one of the things that I liked better. And um, there's a lot of just little plot points that I think the way that they're set up and the way you see them pay off later on is just very satisfying. Um, overall, uh, I will say, because someone asked me about this, actually I was talking to Ryan, the marketing intern last night, and he said, what book are you reading? And I told him, and he's like, oh, yeah, I bought that. And I was like, why? Did you hear us talking about it? <laughs> and uh, he said, no, he heard about it on Twitter. And, I, and he said, do you do you have to know a lot about metal to, to get this book? And I was like, oh, well, that's a good question. No, you really don't. Like, there's a lot of music talk throughout the book. Very heavy at the beginning, but I would say that I don't know much about metal at all. And I still really, really enjoyed the read. So please don't let that be a deterrent. Uh, for you, because uh, anybody who picks up this book will be able to to get everything out of it that they need to. Uh, I'm being very long-winded, so I'm going to cut it off. I thought the book was very good, and um, yeah, just a, a unique, fun story, and I'm going to give it four and a half stars. That is much higher than I expected from you for this book. Oh, Yeah. <laughs> much higher because of the because of the metal stuff yeah I, I don't know yeah I, I mean yeah that too yeah i i don't know i did not expect a four and a half star review hey there's a i found because uh livius and i shared a paper copy of this book i found a piece of paper uh in in, in between some of the pages that said this book is awesome and whoever <laughs> wrote that is absolutely right <laughs> so um before i go into my wrap up Big thanks to longtime friend of the podcast, Jesse, um, who surprised me with this book. I went to my mailbox and I go, this is a book. Go, Holy shit, this is from Jesse. I open it up and it was that book with that post-it note on there, which Jesse may not have understand, also served as a great bookmark while I was reading yeah, the book. Yeah, totally. Because I don't own a bookmark anymore. So thank you, Jesse, for sending the book. And it was really, honestly, a wonderful surprise. So loved it. What a, um, what a guy. Yeah. Now, now let's get to the meat and potatoes of this thing. I have um, I have some issues with this um, with this book. And if you didn't catch it from my reading of the synopsis, I'm going to deliver the line <laughs> where only a lone girl with a guitar can save us all. Um, I had some real issues with the climax of this book. And I'm weighing that against some things I talked about in spoiler talk. And I'm going to talk about those things now, albeit very vaguely. Um, I have read a lot of horror books in my life. Um, this book and this story, which which Rob is a little more endeared to the story overall. I, was, I don't think it was a bad story. Um, Rob got a little more out of the story than I did. I felt like these two scenes are the most terrifying scenes I've ever read in a book. Rob frequently says that I'm completely desensitized. And, and sometimes I catch myself being desensitized. I think he's right. But I read two scenes in this book that were so goddamn scary 
that they weigh a lot more. Those 40 pages, 30 pages, whatever it is, carries a weight for me in this book that that begins to overcome um, some of the issues that I had. Uh, I think Grady is a very talented horror writer um, who I would love to see write. Um, God, you know, I've had I've had um, uh, the the Hell Priest. I've had Pinhead on the brain for a couple of days now. And sometimes I think back to like Clive Barker and I think to some of the stuff that he wrote and how well Grady Hendrix writes in that kind of world, like in that genuinely terrifying kind of world. And he does that in this book. For me, that's offset a little bit by some of the issues I have, which, again, I can't discuss here because they're very spoilery. But the um, media snippets, I'll call them, at the end of each chapter, combined with with the overall good story. I really like the conspiracy theory stuff. I thought that that fit very well um, into this book and and how genuinely horrifying those scenes are. The, the more I think about it, really kind of outweigh the issues that I had. Um I'd like to see him write, and I hate to say this because I don't, <laughs> it's going to sound not the way I mean it. I'd love to see this guy write something that maybe is a little more serious than this book. Um, so maybe overall a little darker. Um, so I, I'm going to, I don't know, I've been thinking about Horror Store, his other book, one of his other books, and, and thinking about picking that up and seeing where that goes. That being said, uh, this is the book we're talking about. I'm going to go a little bit lower than Rob, but really, I mean, there's some really great stuff in here. Um, overall, I'm going to go oh, like four stars, I guess. Hmm. You seemed to, the nice thing about that is you seemed conflicted. Like you felt like it wasn't like, oh, I just know that this is a four. You seem like a little conflicted about it. Well, like I said, there's. I guess it always sounds bad when I say this. There's genuine <laughs> great, great stuff in here, but there's also some stuff I thought was kind of bad. Yeah. So, you know, like I said, overall, I really feel that you embrace the overall story more than I did. And I was more along for the ride. Yeah. And experiencing some great and at times some not so great things. So I was really hoping that my insights over in spoiler talk were going to tip you over a little bit more than I don't know, man. I'm at did. four stars. So it's good. I'm not going to, yeah. yeah, nobody should complain part about Part of that is probably a credit to you and spoiler talk where I always learn a little something from Rob. <laughs> the bread is her soul. That's a quote from uh, Seinfeld. That's a Seinfeld episode. Great. As I, as I talk about how insightful you are, you throw out a Seinfeld quote. That's yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Hey, Rob. Uh -oh. My understanding was <laughs> that somebody just asked you if you needed to know a lot about metal <laughs> to enjoy this book. Yeah, yeah, um, I, yeah, that is true. And I, I admitted I don't know a lot about metal. <laughs> so I don't, and, and again, I don't know if you know this or not. So um, the reason I know how many chapters there are, I think it was 31, is because I wrote down the name of each chapter what, what do you know why that might be? Oh, um, yes. It, they were all references to songs or albums, I'm guessing. They were all metal albums, actual metal albums, with the exception of Troglodyte, which was by Dirtwork, which is the right. band in the book. So one thing I liked about this book, you always have the like the like two ways you can go when you write a book that takes place in the real world. So, I mean, I'll say like if you're writing a book and you're an actor. Yeah. Um, you can say things like, oh, and, and I got beat out for that job by Mel Gibson. Right. Or you could say things like, oh, I got beat out by that job by Bob Smith. Like you can invoke real people <laughs> from the real world into your book. And Mel Gibson. Yeah. In this book, they used they used a lot of actual bands, you know, Dirtwork opened for such and such a band and it's a real band yeah. or, you know, they, you know, she's practicing. She's practicing songs by Black Sabbath, you know, not by, you know, whatever, some some made up band. So as I was reading this, I decided that I would write down the names of all oh, of boy. these albums. And I'll, I'll be <laughs> honest, I did not know all of them. I knew the vast majority of them. As a matter of fact, there are a couple bands in here I'd never heard of. So I don't know if they're just newer metal bands, but I definitely as a teen spent a, a lot of time um, listening to, to heavy metal. So I am going to take right now and I'm going to challenge Rob. Hopefully Rob will do this honestly without Googling anything. All right. I guess I'll put my phone down. I am going to take <laughs> five, I guess five album names. And these will be the ones that I honestly think are a little more mainstream 
right. then then you know yeah. so i'm not going to give you anything i didn't recognize you know what i mean so yeah. and to see how well you do wait do i have so, to answer what the band is yes yeah i'm going to give you the name of the of the chapter and you are going to um see if you can if you can come up with the name of the the band that that whose album it is <sighs> all right this is going to be interesting um, so play along, listeners, especially if you're metalheads or if you listen to a lot of rock music or or, or whatever. Rob is going to see what he can do out of five. And I'm honestly, uh, there's a couple in here that are super, super easy. So I'll tell you right now, I'm not going to give you like for those about to rock, we salute you. <laughs> but I will give you more mainstream stuff. All right. So number one, Diary of a Man Man. <laughs> I have no fucking idea. All right. That's Ozzy Osbourne's likely most popular oh, album all okay. right that's great um master of puppets oh it's metallica all right i thought you might get that one stay hungry <sighs> sorry that's all right that's twisted sister so you're one for three <laughs> give you two more let's look through here um that one's too easy that one's i really like that album um high and dry that's a that's a Radiohead song off the album The Bends. Yeah, no. I mean, yes, it might be. Um, High and Dry was by Def Leppard. All right, let's see if we can get you to two for five. We're going to give you a, a super easy one. Destroyer. I'm just going to I'm gonna throw out a, a band name. Okay. Because I just don't care if I get it wrong. I'm just going right. to say Slayer. Oh, no. There was <laughs> definitely there was definitely a Slayer one. Rain and Blood, which is their most popular one. Um, Destroyer was by Kiss. Oh, oh yeah. I, got, I, probably yeah. Could, I could have guessed that, I'm guessing. So, at any rate, if you're a fan of rock music, it's almost a fun game to play while you're flipping chapters to see how many you recognize. I didn't keep count. I, I think I was probably at like 18 or 20 of the 32. Wow. A couple of these I, I actually had to Google. One of them is by a band called Amon Amarth. A M O N yeah. space A M A R like I've never even heard of that band. Yeah. I think so that's I an know. Italian sports car. That's, that's maybe that's what I should do. Give you names <laughs> and see if you can name what the what the product is. So. Uh, yeah. Hey, I got that Radiohead one. So that's, yeah, sort of. Yeah. Now I'm, yeah. I'm paranoid that it's not even on the bends, and I'm going to look like how an about, asshole. How about anyway. Paranoid. Paranoid. Anything? It, wait, album name Paranoid. There isn't. Is there an album named Paranoid? Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna guess like Black Sabbath then. Yeah, Black Sabbath. So there you go. That wasn't uh, on the actual list and wasn't in the book, but yeah, that's okay. the ra- The Radiohead song "High and Dry" is on the bend, so I feel a little better about myself. Um, <laughs> did I tell you about my uh, Anthrax connection? I don't believe you have. Um, the drummer from Anthrax is a regular customer at the retail store that I uh, work at. He apparently I... lives in the area, so. I do vaguely now remember yeah. that, yeah. but is it's it? not Scott Ian. I guess Scott Ian's the singer, and you said it's the drummer. It's Charlie, so the drummer's name is Charlie Benante or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, super nice guy. Um, I see him all the time, and um, I haven't, I, I haven't directly like worked with the dude, but uh, I've been at a table like answering questions, and he was there like at the table too. So, uh, can you name any Anthrax songs? No, not at all. Anthrax had what I, I think. And someone can call me out on this. Might have been the first like metal rap song called "I'm the Man." Oh yeah, I strongly encourage you to to YouTube that um, after after the show. <laughs> so watch the vi- it's the video specifically, not just uh, listen just to the- just to hear it. I, I think okay. there's a video. I don't know. I mean, a lot of this stuff was was kind of early video days, so I don't know if there's an actual video, but it's definitely a song you should hear. I'm the man. I'm the man. I'm the man. Anthrax. Okay, I brought that up on YouTube, so I can listen to it later. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know, like metal. All right, so there was a band. I got all right. So you're gonna. This is gonna surprise you most likely, um, but um, from the people that I would hang out with when I was in high school and stuff like that, uh, a, hand, a couple of them were really into the band Manowar. Yep. And uh, so I listened to a lot of that. I should have given you Fighting teen. the World, because that's, that's when I, I said, oh, I had yeah. that album, I really like that album, that's, yeah, Fighting the World by Man of War. I would not have remembered that. I would have gotten that wrong any- <laughs> anyway. So I guess of the bands that were mentioned, probably the one that I spent the most time listening to was, of all bands, Man of War. 
Man of War is like an embarrassing band to yeah. be, being a fan of. Well, yeah, yeah, because they're cause like they were, kind of like yeah, theater. Yeah, like axe wielding Conan the Barbarian yeah. guys. They're like D and D theater metal. Yep, yep. But they're I like their I like <laughs> the sound of their music and and I like the fact that that it all kind of told stories. So yeah, and that I mean I mean they did some crazy stuff. They did uh, the thing that I liked was they did. Um, and this is just me. I don't even fucking care if people think I'm a nerd for saying this, but like one of their albums had the bass player playing, um, the flight of the bumblebee song all on the bass. And that shit was fucking insane. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, I'm, I'm look, it's man of war on tour. Rob and I are going to yeah, see, go see a man of war show. It, it, it was called sting of the bumblebee. Cause obviously it's like metal and shit. So it has to be sting of the, instead of flight of the bumblebee. All right, so uh, let's see, Man of War Tour. <laughs> they are on tour. Um, Come on, are they still a band? They, they were like, here's the problem. Like 30 there's, years ago. I'm guessing that this is, this whatever so metal here's the problem. If you're going to have a tour page and you can't put the year of the tour, that's bad. I'm guessing Ooh. that they are currently on tour. Ooh. And uh, it looks like, like, like maybe they're in Germany. Oh wow, they're an American band. I always thought they were European. All right, I'm gonna go see. Yeah, they apparently are only playing in Germany this year. So, hmm. That's well. Isn't that where metal still exists? Um, I maybe I don't know. What what country? Like... What country is N O? Is it Norway? Maybe Norway. That would probably be Norway. That makes sense. All the death yeah. metal and stuff. So they're playing uh, a lot in Germany and Norway. Yeah, I was listening. There's a there's a podcast that I, I sometimes listen to that has um, uh, Dave Windorf from Monster Magnet mm-hmm. is on a, as a guest from time to time, and um, he's always talking about European tours. He doesn't really talk about touring in the U.S. so much. So I'm doing the devil horns at you, man. I know you can't see it, but oh man, I'm sure there's an emoji for that. <sighs> yeah, Does that take anything out of it. Anyway, it's right next so. to the shocker emoji. Right. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Dirt work. Dirt work. We didn't mention that that's D U R T W U R K, but the U's have, and I'm sure there's a name for them. They're the, the um, umalots. The crew dots. Yeah. Um, umalots. Is that what they're called? Is that umalots? I yeah. think that might be right. So yeah. at any rate, that's um, that's we sold our souls. Um, again, special thanks to to Jesse for uh, for sending that our way. Dude, I honestly thought that you were going to spend some time really digging into talking about metal like this is your chance man and I don't have a look i spent i was in seventh grade <laughs> i think and a kid i was friends with loaned me the cassette for um for a judas priest album it was defenders of the faith and i instantly fell in love with uh with with hair bands and and metal and the whole thing and at the time in chicago um there was one station and, and really you could only catch it if you were on the north side of the city. It was a little, I don't know, thousand watt yeah. station out of Highland Park that actually sold time. So you could pay to have some of their airtime. And for many, many years, um, the, the station was WVVX out of Highland Park. It was 103.1 mm-hmm. FM in Chicago. And um, starting at 8 p.m. every night was a show called Real Precious Metal. So if you had your antenna up on your radio and you were creative and added some tin foil to it and pointed it in the right direction, you could listen from eight until two a.m. to oh. these uh, to to it, nothing nothing but like I said metal and in hair bands and and rock ballads and stuff like that. It wasn't all death metal or anything like that. They just played anything that fell into that kind of like metal category. And for a number of years, I mean, there was a period of time where at eight o'clock everything else in my life ceased to exist. And I would I would just put that on and I would listen for two, three, four hours. Sometimes I'd fill a 90 minute cassette, you know, where I'd like do the oh, thing, yeah. record from the radio and then I'd listen to it during the day when it wasn't on that kind of thing. And because that station didn't have a huge um, area that it covered and it, it was kind of, you know, it was hard to get and not a lot of people knew about it. They got all the concert tickets to metal shows. So I probably went to 15 concerts where I just won <laughs> tickets from a radio station. Wow. Yeah. Cause you'd be like caller 13 who gets tickets to this. And sometimes I'd call and I'd be caller like three and eight and 11 and 13. 
because it was like me and one other person just calling just bouncing back tickets. and forth yeah, yeah. yeah so i mean I, I went to see my first metal show i went to see was king diamond which remind the blind king really reminded me oh. of king diamond um in this book i went to see king diamond i think twice on free tickets from them but yeah i mean it was a variety of shows i got to go to and some music that i got exposure to that quite honestly in 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 a pre-digital world you, you got music because you heard it on the radio or your friend loaned you a, or, or, or recorded you a copy of the album or, or the cassette or something. So there wasn't this discovery of music where now I go on my Google Play Music app and if I like a band, if I scroll to the bottom, it gives you similar artists right. and you know what other people like that like this song. Like that didn't exist. And radio in Chicago didn't provide that. It was literally like urban dance music. Um, like Oh, yeah, B96, you know, right? Yeah, what I'll call like old people music, like like – um, I don't remember. It was, it was uh, what the hell was the one light something? There were light FMs like yep. 101.3 or something. Light FM. There was some country music, some classical music, and then like the old fogey music, which is what I call like the classic rock, which was all just like Zeppelin and Black Sabbath and stuff <laughs> like that. So this was this was a special thing for me. I mean, I spent a lot wow, of time man. in my teen years going to these shows and, and listening to that music. I don't very much anymore. I go down the rabbit hole once in a while. My music tastes, thankfully, have changed over the last 30 plus years. But, uh, you know, yeah, I, I hold a lot of this stuff dear. It was really nice to to read the chapter title and immediately be taken back. Like, that's an album that I owned. I remember three or four songs I really liked off there. So that was that was a nice touch for for those of us who were who were into that at the time. I, uh, yeah, I feel like for for me, generationally, um, I was just a little too young for metal. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, because grunge was really where I started caring about music. Grunge and like Two Live Crew, so it was like either really offensive rap music or it was it was grunge. And um, like to the like eternal disappointment of my cousin, who's like nine years older than me, who's just like, "What fucking happened to you?" Um, so yeah, that was always just like I, I grew up in the wrong time. Like I, I I enjoyed Motley Crue until Nirvana showed up, and then I was like, "All right, well, I guess this is what I'm listening to now." And that was that. I did. I will say that. <laughs> this memory of this guy I used to work with in some grocery store when I was a kid who really wanted to get me into some of the more like heavy stuff. And he made a tape, uh, of like, you know, all of his favorite, like, like really hardcore metal band songs, mm -hmm. just kind of like, you know, get me, a, give me an idea of what, what was out there. And the, the tape, the thing I loved about this tape that I think was just so great was that he opened the tape. The very first song was the theme music from Halloween. Nice. Like that little piano, like, din, 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 like, you know, Oh, I know, I know. Yeah. And, and that was his way to, to, to kick off like this hardcore metal music. And I was like, all right, well, I guess that makes sense. Yeah. Um, a lot of these bands are still putting out albums though. <laughs> yeah. And I get excited. I see the name. I go, Oh, I got to listen to this. So it can clear an hour of my schedule. I put on the first song. I listen to half of it. I skip to the second song. I listen to a quarter of it. I put on mm. the third song, and then I go back to doing something else. It's really where I'm at with the those bands that are still making music 30 years later. That's it. Yeah. So, at any rate, hey, you mentioned the theme from Halloween. I am ridiculously excited about the new Halloween movie. Fuck yeah, dude! I think we talked Just about this it. like. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it's coming out. It's not coming out in October, right? It's coming. Well, no, it has to. No, be, no, it's yeah. It's October 19th, I think. Something uh, right around there. It's going to be two nice. weeks before Halloween. Yeah, very excited. I already have plans to take off early on the day it comes out and go see it. So, wow, you're, you're... expect expect my mini review on the episode following that. Oh, hey, we could go sit in those uh, leather seats like we did for thirty one. So we fucking make an episode weird. Out of it. So weird. Yeah, we might we might have to do that. We'll have to we'll have to talk on that. But yeah, I'm uh, really excited. As a matter of fact, just a couple weeks ago, I rewatched the first Halloween and then tried to erase the memory of all the other ones, just like this oh, movie yeah. does. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess thinking about it, um, we're going to have a Halloween episode coming up. So we have to figure out mm -hmm. what what's uh, what that entails, because it's going to be one of our it's our. I think it's our first and most enduring holiday episode, right? Correct. Correct. So it's the one I it. always have the most fun on. We got to do it up right this year. Yep. But first, before that, we have a number of books and interludes to bring you guys. So um, the next book we'll be bringing you. Um, did you read 
did you i mean you know about james Frey, right in a million little pieces yes um i feel like for a time we were debating uh reading his like last gospel of christ or whatever book he wrote whatever you remember Mm -hmm. you remember talking about that yep um and then we ended up not reading that um so i've not read anything by james Frey. we are going to review katarina by james Frey on the next episode um I'm not going to say a lot about it now. I plan on kind of Wikipedia catching everybody up on that episode, but uh, just real briefly, I guess, for for the uninitiated. Uh, James Frey wrote a book called A Million Little Pieces, critical acclaim, went on Oprah, Oprah cried. Uh, Oprah launched, catapulted that book to like number one on every list everywhere in the universe. And then it turned out that um, the book was portrayed as a true story. And I guess it wasn't. So, yeah, it was, it was marketed as a memoir, I believe. Yeah. So James Frey um, plummeted from hero to heel um, in record time. So there's a lot of bad feelings out there towards James Frey. Um, I, I've seen some of the stuff that's been written about this book, mostly headlines. I've been trying not to kind of taint my own my own mm-hmm. opinion of the book, and I'm, I'm most of the way through it at this point. But we'll analyze, is James Frey a talented writer? Um, or is he just uh, following up on the, the memoir scandal and, and trying to grab some money um, just by name recognition? So that'll be uh, that'll be next week. Yeah, I think that's going to wrap it up. So until we talk about the scandalous James Frey, I'm Rob Olson. And I'm Olivia Snedden. Rock on. <laughs>